I don't think the, the arrow could have been sold to the United States directly uh, because uh, the United States Air Force has an almost iron rule. They never buy anything that isn't invented in the United States. But what they do, and what I think might have been done, is that they sometimes help finance sales to other allies. And it's my belief that um, if Mr. Howe, for example, had still been around, that he could have done something. At that time, um, uh, Canadian real estate was still important to the United States. It's not now, but then it was. Uh, they had to count on us for the uh, radar lines and for a number of other facilities, for refueling facilities and so on. And uh, we had a lot of leverage. We had a lot of power at that time in negotiations. And I think someone like Mr. Howe could have said, all right, you won't buy it. This we understand, this we know. But we want your help in financing the sale of this aircraft to some of the other allies that you traditionally help. And with his kind of persuasion, I personally believe that it could have been done. Yes, on balance, I think it could have been sold. When you look at the attempts of the French to sell Mirage fighters or uh, other countries to sell weapon systems, you get the tremendous involvement, not only at the business level, but at the most senior political levels, where a prime minister or a president will go out to sell a program. Uh, I, don't, I don't think in this country that we have a tradition of involving the senior political community in selling weapon systems. And I think if that kind of pressure had been applied in relation to the United States, where there was a gap in weapon systems that the arrow could have filled, I think that could have been done. And it's a lesson we still have to learn that if you're going to sell major programs, then you need major political effort in support of those programs. The Arrow was the most sophisticated weapon system this country had ever created. Its performance, even in the curtailed flight tests, placed it among the best in the world. But the sales effort that went along with it was amateurish and tentative. And when that failed, the Arrow met an ugly fate. In April 1959, Ottawa sent instructions to destroy the five Arrows that had flown and all the work on the assembly line. Men who had worked to build the planes were now ordered to cut them to pieces. As to who issued the order, whether it came from cabinet or from a bureaucrat, no one is telling. In Mr. Diefenbaker's uh, memoir, he, I think he said that, uh, that he was not aware of these instructions. But uh, I was aware of them because I was the fellow who received them. And like an idiot, I, I folded. And so I'm the person that issued the instructions to destroy the airplanes. And that's the worst mistake I ever made in my life. Cameramen were not allowed inside the plant to record the destruction. But one enterprising photographer rented a plane and took this series of aerial shots. They were cut up with torches in the, in the hangar there and hammered down with steel balls like they destroy buildings. After the aircraft were dismantled, the pieces were sold to a Hamilton junk dealer for six and a half cents per pound. At 67,000 pounds, a scrapped arrow would have cost you $4,355. A few weeks earlier, a request for one or more of the arrows had come from Britain for use in flight testing. The request was not refused. It was simply withdrawn, presumably on advice from Canada. Three could have been flown to England with two more to be used as backup spares for the first five we had flying. Canada wouldn't let them go. I mean, the reason is obvious. Had those aeroplanes ever got to Farnborough, and Farnborough realized the fantastic performance, I mean, Diefenbaker in no way ever justified his cancellation of that program. And I'm sure that's why they were never let go. Well, the five arrows that had flown, and for which there was uh, uh, some interest on the part of the Royal uh, Aeronautic Establishment in Britain. They would want, wanted to take a couple of those and, and work further on research with them. Those were destroyed. Those were cut into scrap. Well, there, uh, I, I can't give you the detail now of the uh, issues that went into the destruction of a particular uh, copy. But I can tell you that in general, there was no deliberate destruction to do away with the arrow. Far, far from it. It was just a case of what was the economical way of disposing at that particular time of uh, various copies of the plane that were in various stages of production. 
And as you know, the, what happened after that, it was just like a de-Stalinization program. We were ordered to destroy all film on the, all original negative film on the Avro, Avro all the uh, still pictures, black and white, all stuff that had been developed during the flight test phases of the airplane. These were, Ottawa's instructions were to destroy these. They ordered us to destroy the airplanes by breaking them up. And uh, I think uh, the day I saw that uh, production line being put to the cutting torch, it's the nearest I'd come to shedding a tear over an airplane. It was pathetic. Looking back on this extraordinary event, the scrapping of the arrow still seems an act of either inspired malevolence or of criminal stupidity. A mocking epitaph to the work of the men and women who built her. Did you see any aircraft being destroyed? No. No. I could have if I wanted to, but I didn't. I couldn't. I don't think any people wanted to go and watch such a massacre. Frightening sight. The people who were part of the arrow story are now 21 years older. David Golden was then Deputy Minister of Defence Production. He is now the head of Telesat Canada, the satellite agency. And he has not changed his mind about whether cancelling the arrow was the right thing to do. It's not, in my view, something that one can be dogmatic about, but I would certainly come down on the side of saying, yes, painfully, regrettably, it was the right decision at the time under all the circumstances, and I think so now too. Well, you've got to look at it from various points of view, you know, from the country's point of view, was it a mistake? Uh, I think uh, that you really can't afford to uh, abdicate from this, the thrust of technology. Um, the airplane was a good airplane. Uh, it probably would have sold a hell of a lot of copies. If you have to look at it strictly from the standpoint of defense, and uh, the amount of defense dollars that the era was going to take, then I don't really think that the government had any choice. Certainly, it would have taken all of the defense money that was then available. The Navy and the Army would have had nothing. They would have been totally bereft for years. And this, from their standpoint, I think was, it was untenable. If you look at it from the national standpoint, in other words, you ignore the defense budget and say, what is the best thing for Canada, for our industrial base, for our scientific base, for our um, national base, our feeling of Canadianism, for the great things that we're capable of doing, then personally, I think it was a disastrous decision. Well, again, looking back, uh, the loss, the enormous loss that we have endured uh, in the people and in the technology one wonders if it would not have perhaps been uh, worth it to have accepted those higher costs at that day to retain that uh, type of talent and technology here in Canada. But that's hindsight, and hindsight's 2020 version. And in those days, well, I don't think anyone really appreciated the impact, the enormous impact downstream, 10 years, 15 years later, of that decision. the consequences? One of them was a shot in the arm for the American Moon Project. A number of top engineers were immediately snapped up by NASA. Brian Erb, a young engineer, developed the heat shield for the Apollo spacecraft. Len Packham, in charge of the rocket test program with Avro, worked on the telemetry system for the first manned rocket launchings. And Jim Chamberlain, chief technician at Avro, was project director for Gemini and is now with McDonnell Douglas in Houston. Engineer Ken Cook went from Avro straight to McDonnell Douglas in St. Louis. He's now a systems engineer on the F-18, which his company hopes to sell to Canada for two and a half billion dollars. It seems the era of the manned interceptor is not over after all but it's unlikely we'll ever have another arrow. Shortly after the cancellation, we signed a defense production sharing agreement with the U.S., tacitly agreeing never again to undertake production of a major weapon system on our own. The question returns. Can a country the size of Canada ever compete in the business of building costly weapons of war? <laughs> 